is show number 200 for Comic it is Lab. 200 for Comic Lab, Brad. It cannot be said enough that we are at show 200. Yeah, did you ever think we'd get to 200? You know the answer is yes. The answer yeah, is yes. So did I. The answer is <laughs> so yes. <did> I. <laughs> because you know what? When we started this podcast, I honest to God, I knew if there was one person that was as good, if not better, at stick to itiveness than I am, it's Brad Geiger. Yeah. Uh, I knew this from Web Comics Weekly. I knew this from How to Make Web Comics. I knew this from every project we've ever worked on together. Even even coming down to convention uh, booth exhibiting with you. I know that there is one thing you do that is if you are going to start at something, you're going to start it well and you're going to continue at it until you get it right. And that's what it's been with this podcast. No, I feel I, I was thinking about that on the drive into the studio today, and I feel exactly the same way about you. In other words, you were somebody I was never going to have to worry about motivation. Uh, you were I was just going to turn on the, the uh, camera every day at, on thurs on tuesday at 11 30 i was going to turn on that camera and you were going to be there just like you always have been and i gotta tell you it's uh, the one thing that has surprised me is how quickly 200 shows have gone by yeah they feel like they have flown by uh, 200 <laughs> yeah. episodes is a lot of that's four years of shows and it feels like it has flown by not for nothing it's technically 400 shows because every week We've been doing two shows. We've been doing the public uh, comic lab, and then we've been doing an extra show for our Patreon backers called Pro Tips. Technically, technically, this is show number 400. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. And that's about an extra 100, 150 hours of podcasting that only our Patreon.com slash comic lab listeners get. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's, but I gotta say, this has been a dang delightful journey, and I would not trade it for the world. I've had so much fun podcasting with you and talking comics and laughing. Frankly, it's the laughing that makes me uh, so happy about this podcast. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's been an absolute delight. And along those lines, we've got a really special show lined up for our 200th, including a special announcement that I'll tease right at the top. But before we get to any of that, we've got to thank uh, some people that actually uh, made it uh, even more fun for us to be here. And that's the good folks at Wacom, W-A-C-O-M.com, the makers of the professional portable, powerful Wacom One. The Wacom One, which both Brad and I have in our studios and use on a daily and weekly and monthly basis. Uh, and love it, frankly. And yeah. as, as two professional cartoonists, it is both uh, going to give you the pro work you want, but is also at a super affordable jump in price. So we are super thankful for the folks at Wacom for sponsoring the show. And on that note, I will say hello, everybody, and welcome to the 200th episode of Comic Lab, the show about making comics. And making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc., and I'm his friend Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of Stripped. And this week's Hour of Comics Advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave, let's talk comics for the 200th time. For the 200th time. And Brad, we have a super exp expensive, super extensive <laughs> show. I was going to say expensive. <laughs> we have a super extensive show today because today we're going to do something incredibly fun. We yeah. have basically taken all of our shared wisdom yeah. from the last 200 episodes and crystallized it down to 20 comics commandments that we are going to share with you. One, two, three, four, yeah. five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All 20 comics commandments that we're going to share across the show. And then yeah. what's really fun is we've crystallized it into a really, really cool comic lab magnet, a five by seven magnet that we're going to have in parallel with the show. Brad, do you want to tell them about it? Yeah, uh, we're going to call it the 20 comics commandments. And we're going to be launching today a quick starter for that at comic lab cash And <laughs> it's going to be not only is it going to be something handy that you can put right in your workspace to remind you of some of our best, most often used advice, the advice that we feel most passionately about. Right. Not only is it that, but it's got a delightful, it's it's done in the style of like a, an illuminated script like a, mm -hmm. that a monk might be working on. So it's got some really fantastic illustrations that go all around the border that are callbacks to Comic Lab bits and, and uh, my parts of the show that have come up throughout the last 200 episodes. 
Absolutely. And so that, of course, is at our favorite URL of all time, comiclabcashgrab.com. That's right, because it's all about friendship, comiclabcashgrab.com. So, Brad, let's get started. Let's jump right yeah. into the 20 Comics Commandments. Do you want to take It's most appropriate that you take us in with the first <laughs> Comics Commandment, Brad. Yeah, oh, and, and there should be no there should be no confusion as to what commandment number one is. You can, in fact, if you're listening at home, you can say it right along with me. Number one is make a good comic. Uh, and that is, of course, number one, because nothing else we talk about for this entire show, nothing else we've talked about for the last 400 episodes is going to have much an effect uh, until you do make a good comic. It doesn't mean that you can't start now. And making mm -hmm. a good comic is going to be an ongoing process. It's not yes. like something you reach to and then you hit the button and it goes. Uh, making a good comic should be something that is an ongoing pursuit. But you do have to know that all of these things that we talk about, whether it's marketing, social media, crowdfunding, uh, all of it is not going to have much of, a, of an effect until that quality that you're working on is where it needs to be. And on the note of quality, uh, of, are you going to feel imposter syndrome as you draw? Of course. Are you going yes. to know, even as you're drawing it, that you can do better with time and effort? Of course. But yeah. what we're saying is all of the following bits of advice, all of the other 19 commandments that we're going to tell you for Comics Commandments, mm -hmm. they only follow when you're really doing your best work. So before yeah. you start focusing on merch, before you start focusing on marketing, really focus on making a good comic. That is Comic Commandment number one. And not only that, but put that into reverse, too. In other words, when you see something that's not working, like you're you're doing something that we told you to do on social media and it's just not working. Keep that in the back of your mind that don't blame social media. Don't blame the hashtag. Mm -hmm. Don't blame mm -hmm. SEO. Uh, all of that is worth looking at and, and doing some fine tuning. But always keep it in the back of your mind. It's not the social media's fault. It might be that you're just not there yet. And that's not an indictment. That's not a, a uh, it's not a, a black mark on your soul. It's just a reminder to you, uh, actually in a very optimistic way, that you have control over this and you can make it better. And the first place to start is with the quality of your comic. And listen, I'm going to jump right off of the word control there because that leads us to comic commandment number two. Yes, it does. And this does. one is a personal favorite of mine. Yeah. I will die on this hill every time we talk about comics. Comics commandment number two, own and control your own work. Yeah. Now, I know this seems simplistic and, and it might seem like, well, of course I'm going to try to own and control my own work. Mm -hmm. But a uh, uh, hundred years of American Canadian comics have shown us that, uh, yes, you might have a nice career with Marvel or DC or Image or Scholastic for 10 years, 15 years. But boy, I really hope you're saving for retirement when you do, because yeah. when you don't own and control your own work, the, the career that you have now is not guaranteed 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now. And more importantly, when you own and control your own work, you can steer it, guide it, direct it in the way that you want to do it, in the way that you know best your art can be handled. I mean, very often you hear complaints from from cartoonists who don't own and control their own work, like, ah, the marketing team didn't get it, or, oh, the PR team didn't know how to market it, or, uh, or they made business decisions that I blatantly disagreed with. Well, when you own and control your own work, that never happens. Yeah. I mean, yes, you might have to make uncomfortable decisions from time to time, but they're yours to make. It's yours to own, it's yours to control, and frankly, it's yours to continue to profit from as the decades go ahead. Absolutely. I, I, one other way of looking at this is that when you work for corporate comics, if you work for a publisher, uh, you can be in a, essentially fired by one person. You find one person yeah, there that yeah. doesn't like you, an art director, an editor, whatever it is. You, If you find one person that doesn't like you or doesn't like your work for whatever reason or has some kind of ulterior motive, they want to bring their friend in, uh, you can be fired. When you have 10,000 bosses like uh, Dave and I have, it's a lot harder to get fired. Yeah. <laughs> I would yeah. much rather work for uh, 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 uh, bosses. And, and, that, and by that, I mean those fans that are uh, involved with your work monetarily, whether mm -hmm. it's a Patreon or a Kickstarter, some kind of crowdfunding. Uh, those are the people that I would rather work for. Uh, not only is it more satisfying not only is it more lucrative frankly mm -hmm. uh, it, it's harder to get fired 
It's absolutely hard to get fired. And and might that mean by owning and controlling your own work that you have a smaller audience than had you worked with a publisher? Yes. Does that mean that you might have a greater income with that smaller audience by owning and controlling your own work? Yes. Does that mean you have greater control? Absolutely it does. And, and much like Brad said in terms of uh, you can't be fired by one person when you own and control your own work. Here's another thing. You can't be the 19th book that they have to publicize that month. Right. You are giving it your all because it is your all. Yeah. It's not just one more book that they have this quarter to public publicize and mm -hmm. release on their schedule. You are the main focus. And you know that because you own and control it, that you'll put in hours that no one else would put in on your own career. So uh, uh, that's one of my favorite ones of the 20 Comics Commandments. Absolutely. And remember, it's also kind of a side note to commandment number two is that you can make a living with a smaller audience. Dave yes. and I don't measure our audience on populace. We measure them by passion. Mm -hmm. Right. Time after time, we see people with much bigger readerships. We see people with a lot larger populace behind them. Our readers have beat them day in and day out on passion. And you can make a very good living if you assemble a smaller but passionate group of people who are behind you. It's it's a version of that thousand true fans uh, philosophy, yep. which is when you're speaking with a true authentic voice that's not watered down by 17 edit editors and a, and a publicist and a publisher, uh, when you're speaking to your truth and writing to your truth in a way that really speaks to your passions, you will find that passionate crowd that also resonates with it. You'll basically find your own tribe. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the the rewards, both financially and frankly, emotionally as an artist, are vastly superior, I think, than having to do corporate work. Um, so let's move on to uh, com Comics Commandment number three, Brad. And this one's very special to you. So why don't you tackle oh, this one? I love, I love talking about this. Ideas aren't special. It's the the execution of the idea that is special. In other words, like I tell my storytelling students uh, every semester at the University of the Arts, ideas are BS. There's, mm -hmm. there's no value to an idea. Uh, it's what you do with that idea. It's your personal creativity that you're pouring yes. into the idea. And that has a knock on effect because what it also means, and, and so many uh, young creators get stopped by this, but what they do is they, they have an idea and then they say, wait a minute, somebody else had a similar idea. I can't do this idea. Somebody already did my idea. If you realize that it's not about the idea, but instead it's about the execution of that idea, you realize that it's okay if somebody else did that idea. Your job is to pour so much of your creativity into that idea that it's indistinguishable at the end. Absolutely. And an idea that we don't often talk about on the show is the idea that um, we're all living in a moment culturally, a zeitgeist, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, of course, similar ideas are going to happen. Like for those of us that grew up in the 80s, there were like four, maybe five movies all based around teens and science. Do you remember this, Brad? Yep. There was oh, like absolutely. weird science. There was a, there was like seven movies all in a row. Bang, bang, bang. All about yep. teens and science mm -hmm. uh, and sort of the mishaps of science experiments. And uh, they were all in a zeitgeist. They were all in a moment, right? right. And the, the same is true uh, with right, right, right now, we're having a zeitgeist of zombies or a zeitgeist of this or that. You can pick the topic. And, and writers will, will uh, having consumed similar materials, lived in the same time, shared the same culture, they'll yeah. have a zeitgeist moment where you'll have two very different artists on opposite sides of the planet yeah. um, come up with very similar ideas. The same thing, bad, uh, we might as well mention it happened. Remember that idea that I threw out on this show? comics and kai <laughs> yeah. or, uh, cowboys and kaiju yeah uh, a very uh similar idea a, a cartoonist uh, kick-started a book called kaijus and cowboys that's a completely <laughs> zeitgeist <laughs> moment right <laughs> like yeah. neither one of us knew or were aware of the other ones we just had basically yeah. a very similar title idea for a very similar comic and but right. as brad said it's the execution that matters not the idea that matters because that's where you bring uh, your originality to it um that's where you get a very similarly structured shows that can feel very different in terms of sitcoms, in terms of dramas, in terms of comics. So let's move on to uh, Comics Commandment number four. And this is one of Brad's favorites, but I'm going to say it sort of to launch him off. It says, you can't get worse at something you do every day. Yeah. 
And I mean, that's just another way of saying practice makes perfect, but pra practice makes perfect. <laughs> it sounds so smarmy. It's a little bit more optimistic to, to realize that really just your act of showing up and doing the work yes. day after yes. day. It's it's as, I mean, as long as you're kind of paying a little bit of attention, which obviously if you're doing it every day, you are. Uh, you're going to get naturally better, even during those times that it doesn't feel like you're getting better, even though during those times that you are on a plateau and you're not feeling that whoosh of creative right. excitement, you you still are inevitably as inevitably as as water dripping on a rock is going to erode that rock. Uh, your quality is going to improve just by the nature of you keep showing up. What a great visual, the, the idea of a water dripping on a rock, because it yeah. is something like that. Sometimes yeah. you don't notice for years the progress you've been making until you look back and go, oh, I've gotten considerably better since this comic that I drew three years ago, five years ago, yeah. seven years ago. And so, yeah, the idea that you can't get worse at something you do every day is also ultimately, like Brad said, an optimistic note. It's like, are you feeling a little bit less than today as a cartoonist, as an artist, yeah. as a creator? Are you feeling like you have imposter syndrome? Are you feeling like you're not as good as the rest the world. That's okay. You will get better tomorrow and the next day and the next day. It is a constantly upward journey. It's onward and upward, like C.S. Lewis said. Yeah. Uh, and so um, I like the optimism behind it. You can't get worse at something that you do every day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yes, sometimes erosion seems uh, painfully slow, but it's also painfully powerful. Yeah, look at the Grand Canyon as, as an excellent example. Yeah, sometimes it's painfully slow. Uh, but it's also, uh, uh, you know, powerfully beautiful all at the same time. Yeah, uh, yeah. Don't don't discount that. And, and keep that in mind the next time it feels like you're just not going anywhere. You're going someplace. It's inevitable that you're yeah. going someplace. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move on to number five, which is a great one that both Brad and I love, which is good writing saves bad art. Rarely does that work in reverse. Yes. And I can on the just on the tip of my tongue name 20 cartoonists where the good writing saves bad art. But yeah. boy, I I am struggling to think of an artist for whom their comic, their great art saves terrible writing. Right. Yeah. Can you can you think of one, Brad, where I mean, we don't even need to shame and name and shame uh -huh. anybody. But it's so hard, you know, to think of someone where the, the good art saves bad or boring or terrible writing. Yeah, I, I really can't. And and I would I would hasten to add, I probably wouldn't say anybody's <laughs> name since it's how we framed it that way. But no, it, it really, and that's, again, going back to our initial comments uh, on number one, uh, if, if you are finding that you are not hitting your audience, uh, I'm telling you, I, without looking at your comic, with the, uh, within an 80% chance of being right, uh, I can tell you it's your writing. And if you're working in humor, that number rises to 99% of my yeah. uh, chance yeah. being right. Uh, if you're doing humor and you're not connecting, you don't see that thing going on social media. You're not audience yep. building over a period of time. It's your writing. Your jokes aren't connecting. Your punch, you need to work on the punchline. That's something very, very important for comics artists to remember because so many of us came to this art form because we were artists first. We mm -hmm. came to be drawn literally and figuratively to this art form because we appreciated the visual nature of the storytelling. Some of us, and I absolutely count myself in this category, had to come to the writing secondarily. We, I, I had, I had to physically make myself become a better writer. It had to be a conscious effort to, be, to improve my writing. And as soon as I started paying more attention to that, I saw very, very quick results. Yeah. And most of us, because uh, the visual is so immediately clear, mm -hmm. we, uh, of course, want to focus on this tree that I drew this week is yeah. better than that tree that I drew seven months ago. Yeah. But it's more uh, difficult. There's 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 uh, uh, a, a deeper itch to scratch to really hone your writing, which is not so immediately clear, but yeah. values uh, the the overall comic so much more. If your writing is florid, if your language is precise, if mm. your word choice has amazing diction. Uh, so that's something you really want to hone in on uh, as you go through with your comic, because good writing, as we say, saves bad art. Rarely does that work in reverse. Absolutely. Now let's talk about number six, uh, commandment number six, 
Uh, And it's something you've heard me say before on this show. You can't drive towards your style. You can only see it in the rear view mirror. Right, Dave? Absolutely. Yeah. And this actually builds off of Brad's wonderful uh, idea of the uh, the water dripping on the stone is that you can't see as you're working on it, that water slowly eroding that rock. But as you look back over the years and decades, you see, oh, I see how my eye style had changed. I see how my chiaroscuro evolved. Oh, I see how my panel framing uh, slowly became my style, my Brad Geiger style, my Dave Kellett style. I yeah. see that looking back now, but it's very hard. And of course, we all want it in our teens and our 20s to be able to laser focus. Now I am going to create eyes this yeah. way. Now yeah. I am going to draw a car this way. And yet it takes the the effort of 5, 10, 15 years and 10,000 hours of drawing to be able to look back in the rearview mirror and go, now I see my style. Yeah. I see where I have ended up. And our our friend Scott Sava had a way of talking about this that's really worth noting at this point. And it is, he says, his art style is a mosaic of all of his heroes. In other words, he he, went as he studied other people whose work he appreciated, he found that he started to draw, for example, a nose very much the way da Vinci drew noses. And he drew eyebrows the way maybe John Buscema drew eyebrows and then it, it's it, when he looks at his art the way it is today uh it's it's a mosaic of all these little influences so uh, so, uh our uh, advice to you and we get this question uh just about every month on comic lab how do i develop a style how do i develop a personal style well there's two steps to that number and and again remembering you can't actually make it happen Mm -hmm. I I wanted to draw like John Buscema when I was uh, uh, an 18 year old kid. I desperately wanted to draw like John Buscema. I still can't draw like that guy. (laughs) I can't make myself do that. That uh, that art uh, that he produced has a lot of influence on the way I approach art. uh, But I can't I can't make that happen. Uh, and, And so you've really got two steps. Number one. Keep doing work. Keep working and working mm-hmm. and working. Uh, and and because every drawing you do is a problem to be solved that you're working out in real time. Uh, and and all that problem solving, you're going to have pocket solutions that develop that. Uh, oh yeah, I solved this problem. I know how to do that. And then you do that over and over again. Well, that becomes a style. And right. step two, immerse yourself in other people's art. And by the way, this goes for writing. Since we just got done talking about writing, that goes for writing too. You ask a writer, uh, how did you become a good writer? They'll tell you because I was a good reader. They became a good writer through being a good reader. It's the same thing for art as well. The more art that you really study and immerse yourself and allow yourself to uh, uh, languish over, uh, the better you're going to be. Yeah. And every generation of artists feels uh, every new generation of artists feels insecure in those first five, 10 years where they they can sense that they are copying their uh, heroes. Right. But here's the good news. We all do that. Michelangelo did that. Da Vinci did that. Picasso Mm -hmm. did that. Bill Watterson did that. We all copied from our heroes because that is one stage of learning what you can take from their process run it through the filters of your own process and, and, and ideology. And then it becomes your style over five, 10, 15, 20 years because you've incorporated all your heroes, not just one. It's yeah. not just Bill Watterson. It's not just, uh, I, I can't think of somebody else, but you're, you're working in 20 different artists into your style, making it your own. And mm-hmm. as Brad said, uh, over time, you'll look back and go, Oh, I see now the journey and I see how I've arrived at my style. So let's yeah. move on now to a uh, uh, comic commandment. Number seven, lettering. This one's about lettering very specifically. Nobody will read your comic if they can't read your comic. And we have a little side note. And for goodness sake, learn the crossbar eye rule. It's just a, it's a, it's a side note, but God, it's important. It drives us nuts in lettering. Yeah. So Brad, let's talk about lettering that no one will read your comic unless they can read your comic. And it's one of the maxims that we cannot stress enough. And that is your lettering is crucial. Good lettering, and that includes not only uh, a clean, readable lettering, whether it's your hand lettering or choosing a good dialogue font, uh, but uh, setting that up so that the letting is correct, so mm-hmm. that that the, that so that the kerning is correct. 
uh, setting your word balloons up so that they read in the correct order. I was reading right. a gorgeous comic this weekend. And I mean, it was like the kind of stuff that I sat there and I go, God, I wish I was doing this uh, in terms of the illustration and the writing was pretty solid too, but the art was just chef's kiss. And they had a panel where they had, and I'll, I'm going to see if I can uh, explain this. If you, if you split the panel into quadrants, they had one word balloon in the upper right and one balloon in the lower left. Oh. Now, when you do that, there is no way to know which word balloon goes first. There just isn't because we right. read in a Z formation. We start in the upper left and we go across diagonal down and then across this person. And, and then it started happening in multiple panels over and over. And I, I stopped reading it because I'm like, and, and I loved the way this comic looked. I was seething with jealousy that I don't draw this well. Yeah, and, and some yeah. of the scenes, some of the, I had to stop reading it <laughs> because the lettering was driving me crazy. It kept taking me out. I couldn't read the word balloons in the right order. It's like walking into a house. I don't know if you've ever gone to a real estate open house where yeah. it is a beautifully built house. Yeah. All the construction materials are uh, par excellence and, yeah. and the, the windows are lovely. The flooring, my God, what gorgeous flooring they have. And look at all the fixtures. All these bathrooms are gorgeous. But the flow of the house makes no sense. You walk in the front door, you're immediately bang, hitting a wall. You take a left, it's a small room. You got to take another right. You're like, who laid out this house? Did, did you not hire an architect? Is it just a contractor build this by themselves? And, and that's kind of like what it's like to read a beautifully drawn, beautifully laid out comic yeah. with a letter doesn't work because if you can't read it, it feels uncomfortable. It feels like slogging through molasses, you know? Yeah. And so that's why you will want to avoid things like uh, crossing the streams because or crossing the tails because yes. just like with Ghostbusters crossing the streams, terrible things happen when you cross the tails. It, it makes the reader confused and, and frankly starts to get them angry. Yeah. Uh, the font and the and the lettering choice of the presentation of the font, remember, is almost like a, a, a quiet second character of yes. your comic. It expresses the mood. So if you've ever read a translated comic like a Junji Ito uh, manga where someone was very kindly translating it from Japanese to English, but then they use like Helvetica or Arial for the font. And you're like, oh, God, this doesn't feel like Junji Ito at all because the lettering matters. It's part of the mood of the comic. Go ahead, Brad. Yeah. And that's as long as we're talking about manga. Let's take a little side trip here for those of us, uh, especially younger uh, listeners who may have come to comics through manga, specifically manga that had been translated into English. Yes. If that is you, you may have a, uh, uh, an, a skewed idea of what a word balloon is because in that manga that was originally written in, for example, Japanese, Japanese characters are written top to bottom, up and down, right? And so mm -hmm. their word balloons are tall ovals. What happened when they were translated into English is somebody literally went in and erased those words and tried to fit English words in that space that remained. So as a result, there's a whole bunch of space a lot of times at the top, a whole lot of space at the bottom, yes. and weirdly tall word balloons for English language paragraphs, which are horizontal. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if that's how you came to comics, Good. I, I'm, I'm thrilled because manga is some of the best storytelling out there. Just don't let that guide how you do word balloons. <laughs> yeah. That that was that was like a best possible of all bad situations solution for translating uh, manga into English language. And it's not a good solution. You should be you know, doing a lot more graceful word balloons than that. Right. And uh, listen, we could do a whole show about lettering in terms oh, of yeah. uh, you want to break your sentences up in in natural, uh, linguistically natural uh, spots. So the dog line break went to the store line break to get a bone, you know, period. Right. Uh, and you also want to have the, the word balloon, the voice bubble, have a consistent negative space all the way around your lettering. Yes. Right. So yes. that like take something like a W or an M, the largest letter that you have, lay it mm -hmm. on its side and run that negative of space all the way around so that it's consistently pleasant uh, for the eye 
to, to find the lettering inside of that word balloon. And just the easy way to, 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 to determine if you're not doing it as well as you could, if your letters bump up against the border of your word balloon, you're doing it wrong. They, yeah. they should never yep. get that close to actually right. bump into them. And then on a final note, just learn the crossbar eye rule. For oh, God's yes. sakes, nothing makes you look more immediately amateur than a suddenly a crossbar eye in the middle of a sentence, in the middle of a word. Yeah. It, it just looks like amateur hour. Please learn the crossbar eye rule. Okay, moving on to comics commandment number eight. And this is one of my favorites. And it goes like this. Time is the best editor. So edit, wait, edit, wait. Yeah. And this is one of the hardest ones to do oh. because we all want to get our work out there and share it. It's the excitement of creation. I did it. I, it's good enough. It's it's good enough. We're putting it out there. <laughs> and it's hard to tell yourself that a little bit of, of wait time yeah. can actually make your editing sharper, crisper, more in, decisive, more incisive. Um, where, you know, none of us can afford necessarily an on staff, quote unquote, editor telling us, well, this is this is it needs to be moved to this over area and right. change the sentence around but time can be your editor future brad can actually fix the mistakes the present brad is making and not seeing you're yeah. coming at it with fresh eyes you're coming at it from a different emotional space and so you can be your own best editor brad so much of this is i i feel almost personally responsible for uh because during the break we were talking about web comics weekly and uh, we had kind of a wide reach in web comics uh, in those early days in the first right. uh, decade of web comics from 2000 to 2010. And because web comics was an ad driven uh, proposition at that point, uh, our, adv our advice during that time was you got to post every day. You got to post on a schedule. If you if you update Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10 o'clock, it's got to be there Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10 o'clock. This was pre social media. This was right. an ad driven revenue. And that was the truth at that time. And I think what happens is. Uh, I think there's a ripple effect of of the people still think that that's how you have to publish. They, they, they and believe me, a schedule is very good if only because it keeps you on track. I'm not saying that schedules are horrible, but I'm also saying they're not as crucial as they used to be. You can take a little bit of time if it means putting out a better product. We talk about that smorgasbord all the time. Your readers aren't going to notice. So if it means you're going to do a better job, take a take a minute, take a beat and then edit it with fresh eyes like Dave says, and you're going to do yourself a favor. And absolutely. And remember that comics is a reductive art. Yeah. We are and not only in our line style, we're taking the world around us and simplifying it to a more iconicized, frankly, cartoony look yeah. that reduces the complexity of the world down to clearer images, cleaner, cleaner messages. Mm -hmm. And the same should be true with our writing. And frankly, no matter who you are in comics, I can almost virtually guarantee that the same message will be better if there are 20% fewer words than what you currently have. And I include myself in there. Uh, <laughs> that a little bit of reduction it uh, really helps uh, both the clarity, both the impact and the, the readability of the comic because yeah. it is a reductive art. It reduces things down. Yeah. And it's so important to keep in mind as you're doing that. Listen, we get it. We're excited to put our new work up, too. Yes. <laughs> but but uh, but take a take a beat. Take it be because that editing is going to make your work better. So, Dave, let's move on to commandment number nine. Oh, and this is such an important one to remember. If you're not enjoying the comic, they're not enjoying the comic. And boy, does this springboard off of uh, the last commandment, because uh, sometimes if we're feeling the pressure to publish or if we're feeling the 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 that time is not our friend, we're forcing an update or we're forcing a comic or we're forcing a chapter when it's not ready or when we're not feeling it. And here's the thing. Comics are uh, they're almost like an emotion transmission engine in yeah. that I I if I'm feeling excitement, if I'm feeling passionate about the comic, if I'm feeling incredible joy that translates into the work. And that, of course, translates into the reader's experience. 
it's it's kind of like the movie like Water for Chocolate, Brad. Do you remember that? Yeah, Where absolutely. if you cry into a recipe, the recipe makes the person cry. That sort of magical realism. Yeah. Uh, with co comics are kind of similar in the sense that if Brad is feeling passionate and excited and joy filled about his comics, when I read them, I feel that too. Now, of course, does that mean like as professionals that every day is going to be just constant joy and smiling? No, of course no. not. But what we're saying is overall uh, that if you're not feeling it, that's a signal that something is wrong in the process and that it's worth tinkering with to find what the joy is, what the spark is that gets you back on track. Absolutely. And it's also a reminder as you're executing this comic, both in the writing and the drawing, if you're in a rut, if you keep doing, for example, I call them puppet show comics, right? Where you've got both characters cut off at the torso, one's facing the other one, the other one's facing the first, and one talks and the other talks, and it's a puppet show. If you if you're executing that, you're going to get bored very quickly. Guess what? So is your readers. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to get bored of a puppet show comic. Yeah, and uh, remember, Punch and Judy, yes, was a was an amazing art form that lasted 300 years in medieval Europe. We don't do it anymore. There's a reason why puppet theater is not a major medium that we go to uh, as our communications. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to number 10, and this one is a fan favorite for this show. Yes. It is a Brad Geiger creation that was fumbled over many a time, but we have now honed it and crafted it. It is, of course, the four C's of social media, yes. and those are Brad Sadly, creation, curation, commercial, and the fourth C, as always, is kindness. As kindness. Now, of course, for those of you that are long listening, you'll remember that we have dropped cremation. We <laughs> removed that one from the list. That was only temporarily on the four C's of social media. But the the idea here to, to, to springboard off what Brad said, the idea yeah. of Brad's four C's of social media are that you are not uh, you're not always under the pressure to constantly be creating. It's not just about you putting comic after comic after comic on there. Uh, that part of your social media feed is a little bit creating uh, a, the or not creating, but sharing the interesting persona and the interesting tidbits of the world that you see it. Uh, yeah. Your interesting take on the world through creation. Yes, but also through commercial, uh, the, the things that you have for sale that are also themselves interesting. And then mm -hmm. importantly, curation. Find yeah. Yes. Other comics that you like, other humorists that you like, other writers and dramatists that you like that you can share. And then the fourth, and frankly, I think one of the most important one is kindness. Yeah. Um, remember that social media is, these are people on the other end. It's not yeah. just some anonymous troll that you need to fight. And and frankly, you don't need to fight at all. You can ignore, uh, and you by, by ignoring uh, negativity and rewarding kindness, you are building a community of kindness in your social media, Brad. Yeah, this is why... Uh, creative people struggle on social media is mm -hmm. because they think number one, their only worth is that one C the creative one and not it. They don't even take a full C when, when they're looking at that. In other <laughs> words, if you take a, 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 your, your garden variety web cartoonist, they'll say, okay, my creativity, that's my comic. Well, no, you are so much more yes. th than your comic when it comes that's to true. creativity. It's anything that comes out of your mind. That's a, that's a clever thought that you had. It's, it's anything you want to share that mm -hmm. all falls under creativity. I, I, there's so much more to your creativity than just the comic. But uh, then we also think, well, it, it, we're stymied by the, that even and we're, we're, we're we don't do curation on social media because we assume that people just want to see my creativity well no we want to see what excites you what what right. what thrills you all of that uh, stuff that falls under curation we want to see that too we want to see what's light in your fire because that tells us a lot about you and then the third c commercial uh, is just there to remind you of this it takes uh, usually about seven uh, messages to get any one person to uh, act. And keep in mind that with the algorithm, your ability to reach that person seven times is is almost uh, 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 stymied, uh, completely drawn to a halt. And, and we just got to go back to that last episode. Dave talked about how hard it was to reach uh, through consistent 30 day messaging. He, he gave you his spreadsheet. He gave you all the different places he was doing it. He was uh, scheduling these posts. Boom, boom, boom. As soon as that uh, Kickstarter was expired, he had gotten his goal and they had uh, closed the doors. The first email he gets is somebody saying, hey, I'm just finding out about this. So that's why... <laughs> 
secure. That's why commercial is one of the three C's right. to not only remind you that it's there, but to give you the permission if you need it to bang that drum and bang it often because that's right. nobody's going to get upset. They're not hearing every one of these. Right. No one else is going to take charge of your career for you. And there is nothing inherently wrong with making a living by sharing your art. So that's the other counterpoint to the commercial is that there's nothing wrong with saying yeah. I made a book and it's great. And I really think you should try it. I have this T-shirt that, that cracks me up every time I wear it. I think you should try it. There's yeah. nothing inherently wrong with that. And if you're doing it right, uh, the commercial can even feel creative. If the message is interesting, if the way you're transmitting it is fun, uh, even that can be a form of creation. So let's move on to comics. Uh, uh, commandment number 11, Brad. Yeah. And I want to note here, and now that we've gotten past number 10, that uh, you'll prop, you've probably already noticed these uh, uh, little tidbits, these pieces of advice started with art and writing. And now we're getting into social media advice. We're mm -hmm. going to go forward towards crowdfunding and business advice. All of this is going to go kind of in a progression as we go from one through 20. And right now we're dead in the heart of social media. And it means we've got to talk about this. Number 11, don't compare your blooper reel to someone else's highlight reel. Right. And this is a, this is a tricky one that no matter what the artist it is hard to do because we yeah. all suffer from imposter syndrome and every yeah. he hero that you ever had suffered from imposter syndrome. And, and separate from imposter syndrome is that sense that you don't belong, that the things that you're doing just don't and can't and will never measure up, right? Um, but here's what we often do. We look on, on social media and everyone else seems to be sharing only their successes. Yes. Brad just got a solid gold car. Brad won an Emmy. Yeah. Brad uh, has a Van Dyke that I'll never have one that looks as good as he does, right? I'll never be Brad Geiger. But in the meantime, Brad's looking at me going, Dave has a silver car. Dave, yeah. uh, which is Dave one is step below so gold. Yeah. Was he? Yeah. <laughs> You had to get to get it in. You had to dig it in. And, just, and, and Dave has a golden globe, which is almost as nice as an Emmy. But that's Dave's right. still doing okay. Is that a golden the globe? Is that the one where I where I bribe the Italian judges? Is that yeah. the golden globe the one that that's, I yeah, okay. That's right. Uh, that's right. Uh so anyway, um, but you get where I'm going at is that no matter yes. who the artist is, uh there is somebody uh, in, inside there going, I'm not good enough. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't belong. I don't, I don't. Yeah. And because we, we inherently compare all of our faults with someone's highest moments. That's not the way the world works. They had a thousand trips and faults and, and, and failures on the way to that summit. We yeah. just don't focus on that. We only see that they won the Eisner or, oh, their book is in a fourth printing, right? Well, right. think about the 10, 20 years of failures that it took to get to that moment for them, yes. you know? And yeah. frankly, the psychological moment that they're probably in the day after they've won the award oh, yeah. where they go, well, I'm back to square one, right? Nothing We're all fighting changed. a journey. It's, like, it's a version of that thing that be kind because you don't know what internal battles people are finding. Yeah. Right. Um, and every one of us as an artist is apt to compare our blooper reel to someone else's highlight reel. But remember that they're doing the same. So it's another it's another impetus to be kind both to others, but also to yourself. You are doing a great job. You are on the path. You are putting in the work and you are getting better consistently. Oh, and remember this. Uh, it turn that on its side. Take that coin and spin it around. And if it helps, if it helps at all, uh, think about it this way. Right now, somebody's jealous of you. Yeah. 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 Right? Well, you are, for example. I mean, so right now, some, I mean, it, it might be hard to believe, but right now, somebody is jealous of Brad Geiger, you know, and, and that's, <laughs> that's how that works. <laughs> and if that makes you feel, I'm not being serious. If, if that makes you feel better every now and again, there's somebody who's like, oh, I wish I could have that. No, I, I listen, I, I was going to make a joke, but the thing is, it's true because Brad, for I know you and with all the love in my heart for you, I know that there are days where you're incredibly insecure and yeah. days where you're feeling egotistical, right? We have, we all oh, have yeah. that, but, uh, there are people that look at your career and go, gosh, darn it. I wish I could do what Brad does. Why? And also there's people that go, that guy doesn't deserve that. He, <laughs> he, you know, the, that's a, the flip yeah. side of that. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, of course, people are jealous of Brad. And in the meantime, yes. Brad's going, I'm not as good as they are, right? It's right. this, this weird 
hate. It's this weird self hatred cycle. Yeah. So uh, it's one that we all constantly have to shake. I have to shake it all the time. So it's just good to remind one another: don't compare your blooper reel to someone else's highlight reel. Why are you laughing at me? What did I do I just, wrong? Just want to give a note. I just want to give a note to our editor, Matt. I and when if you get a chance later on, just isolate Dave saying, "I have to shake it all the time." I just want that separately, just just for my, <laughs> just for God. my. Personal it's just use. gonna be the Brad's ringtone whenever I call. I have to shake it all the time. I have to shake, shake, it, all shake it all the time. I have to shake it all the time. It's like you just do a ringtone. <laughs> that happens when you get older. So let's go on to <laughs> commandment number twelve. <laughs> oh God! Oh God! <laughs> number twelve. <laughs> You uh, now here's one I shouldn't I shouldn't go into this one laughing because out of all of them I've done this one before on TikTok videos I've done this before on on different talks this one gets the most visceral pushback and, and it's be- I think it's because it's really true and people have a hard time with it and it's advice that I once got from Robert Koo the uh the business manager of Penny Arcade I was telling him, I, I think I, I think I should be more popular. I think I should be more successful than I am. And and I, I, and if this sounds familiar to you, I said if I could only get some more people looking at my comic, I think I could. I, I think they'd love it, and I'd be more more successful. I just don't know how to get them to look at it in the first place. And Robert looked me dead in the eye and said, "You have the audience you deserve." Yeah. And I, it just yeah. hit me like a ton of bricks. I said, no, 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 you can't be serious. I, it, there's got to be a magic hashtag. There's got to be one weird trick you do with C, with SEO. There's got to be something that I'm missing, a secret handshake. Give me a, throw me a bone. He said, no, you have the audience you deserve. Uh, and uh, man, just like in the same way I get pushback on it, I gave him pushback. It wasn't until much later that I let that sink in and I started uh, 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 using that information to guide how I did my comic uh, that day forward. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it, it made a huge difference in how I saw things. You have the audience you deserve. You have the audience you deserve. And it's frankly, it's a message that a lot of us, myself included, Don't want to hear sometimes because you want to hear that the system is rigged against you, that had Mm -hmm. you just started 15 years earlier, back when it was easier on the web, that you'd have a bigger audience (laughs) or to Brad's. You just want to know that if you knew what that hashtag trick was on Instagram, that you'd have twice the audience. Right. Yep. Here is the 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 truth of the age we are living in. We're living in one of the most frictionless times for a reader to become a fan. All they have to do is to hit subscribe or hit like. That is such a frictionless transaction. They don't have to Mm -hmm. spend anything. They don't have to do anything harder than scroll to your work, right? And yet uh, you'll find that the vast majority of people will keep on scrolling. They won't Mm -hmm. stop. And, and, And what that means, if you want to look at it from an encouraging standpoint is, you isolate and focus on the 10,000 people that are your tribe. They stopped. Yeah. They subscribed. Yeah. That's the audience you deserve because they share the same passion, the same outlook, the same humor that you have. Or they yeah. they are fired up by your passion, outlook, and humor. Um, but oh, go ahead, Brad. Do you, you want to jump in? It's something that I like to talk about as the magic wand theory. And I don't know whether I've done this on the show before, but I want you to do a thought experiment with me. Uh, And that is this. What if I had a magic wand and could bring a million visitors to your website or to your social media page of choice? Uh, What if I could bring you a million viewers right now, today, Mm -hmm. all in one day, one 24 hour period? Would you take it? And of course, most people would say, yes, of course, that's exactly what I want. That's what a young Brad Geiger wanted when he was talking to Robert Koo. Right. Right. Uh, if, right. If, only, if you could just bring me a million visitors today, if I could get more eyes on my comic, uh, then I think I could be more successful. And the answer is uh, that you already have a million viewers. You, it, it, it might not have yes. been in one day, yeah. but you have already had a million viewers uh, this year, probably. OK, right. in one right. way or another, you had them and you lost them. Yep. You had them and you lost them. And that's because you kept the number that you deserve, uh, but the rest of them you lost. And giving you a million today would be no different. Uh, most of them would bounce. Uh, what does that mean? That means that 
you need to, just like I needed to, and I still need to, this is a journey. This is, I'm not at the end of a journey. I'm on my journey, same as you. I need to continually be improving, to continually be uh, walking this walk, uh, because if you sent me a million viewers today, I'd lose a bunch of them. Uh, It's the same thing. How do you catch them? You've got to improve the quality of your comic. Go back to commandment number one. If uh, Waving a magic wand for most of us would be a useless pursuit. It's funny, you you did exactly what I was going to say, which is go back to the first command, which is make a good comic. Yeah. If you sent me a million readers right now and you sent Matt Inman of The Oatmeal a million readers, yeah. Matt would retain 100,000 readers, I would retain 10. That's yeah. just me ma- internalizing it to me so that you yeah. don't feel bad about your art. I'm yeah. saying Dave Kellett can only capture a percentage because that's yep. what they, that's the audience that I, my comics right now have the ability to capture. Um, that does not mean I can't get better. That doesn't mean right. I can't strive to get those 100,000 that Matt would get, right? Um, but I do everything I can. I definitely try to swing above my weight with my audience size, of course I do that, right? But I always have to strive to be a better cartoonist, to get better so that I can retain more and more people. And frankly, so that the word of mouth will do the heavy lifting for me. People are spreading uh, Matt's comics at a much higher rate than they're spreading mine. That's right. okay, first of all. And yeah. second of all, that means I got to work harder and that's okay too. Keep going, Brad. Yeah. And it also means this, I, it, the whole reason we make this one of the commandments because uh, we feel so strongly about it is because It returns your focus to where it should be because all that time you're spending looking for the magic hashtag is time that you're not spending improving your comic. All that time you're spending looking for SEO tricks is time you're not spending working on your comic. The one thing that you can do that's going to give you the most return on investment for your time is working on that comic. And like we said way back there at uh, number such and so, uh, number five, it's probably the writing. Probably the writing. Honest to goodness, uh, it's probably yeah. the writing. Yeah, and I speaking of probably the writing, I'm glad that Brad turned into his grandmother there for a minute. And as, yeah. as you remember on number such and so, Mr. <laughs> Hoosie Watts, who lives down the street over on What's-His-Name Lane, you know, he's got the daughter with the hair. Anyway... <laughs> You kids have a good day. All right, so let's jump into the uh, the, the next the next uh, uh, comics commandment. This is number thirteen. Yeah. This one's really good for uh, for Brad. Is always uh, particularly good at summarizing this one. But I'll read it first. It's every day someone is reading your comic for the first time. Oh. Now remember, Brad was just got done saying if somebody if we sent a million followers your or a million new readers your way today, which by the way is kind of happening. Every yes. year I'm getting hundreds of thousands, if not a million people seeing my comics somewhere somehow online, right? Mm-hmm. They're seeing Dave Kellett for the first time today. Brad, what does that mean for oh. my cartooning? If especially if you are in the audience building phase of of a comic, if you're starting out, if you're if you're just doing this for a couple of years and you're building audience or if your audience just isn't there yet and you're trying to make it bigger. uh, This is so but this is crucial for that person. It's important to everybody, but it's crucial if you're building an audience. And that is every day somebody's reading your comic for the first time. Now, if you're doing a long form comic, for example, or if you're doing a uh, a comic strip that is that has a storyline that flows throughout it, this is something you cannot ignore. If I come into your comic today, seeing it, seeing it like for example on your Instagram for the mm-hmm. first time, and if I'm on page twelve on that first exposure, and I if I have no way of knowing what's going on without reading page 11 or or even one through 11 before it, if I have no entry point, if I have no way of at least having a significant, satisfying reading experience in that chunk on page 12, then you've lost me as a reader and you're never going to get me back. I mean, let's face it. What happens is tomorrow I might see it again on Instagram for whatever reason Uh, But now I know your style and I know I remember having a bad experience. So I just keep scrolling. Right. right. You never get me back. (laughs) Even with repeated exposure, even if somebody retweets you uh, several times and it keeps coming across my feed. I remember that style. He was no good. Flip. I have you ever, Brad, I I have a very specific example of that. And uh, for whatever reason, this always sticks with me. Have you ever come across a cartoonist for whom the word count to entertainment ratio oh. is way off. 
Yes. Those are the ones that kill me in terms of giving them a second chance. If yeah. I'm reading what feels like a uh, war and peace, right? Or a oh. Russian winter novel. Oh, if, and ooh. I get to the end of the page and there, there's neither a satisfying ending, nor yep. was there a character arc moment, nor was there a joke, nor yeah. was there. A, a, and you're like, why did I read all of that? Good God. I'll <laughs> tell you what, they rarely get a second chance for me in terms of wordiness. So yeah. uh, you can jump how in. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've done exactly that, right? I get to panel three. And literally, my voice goes, what are the chances it's going to be worth all of this? What reading? are the chances? Yeah. What are the chances I'm going to read? And then you see one of those huge word balloons or you see somebody who's got a, a, a page with, you know, five different word balloons. And they, you've got the tails going all over the which way. And you've got major amount of word balloons, you know, crammed into a panel. And I literally go, what are the chances this is going to be worth it? And I know the answer is very little, very little chances that I'm going to slog through all of this and get to a satisfying ending. And I flip, done, gone, yeah. next. Yep. If yep. you are not putting your comic out there on social media, and let's face it, we talk about late stage social media all the time. But the fact of the matter is, in this moment in history, social media still is a major publishing platform. Uh, you have to you still have to play the game. OK, you can't you can't do what that one guy from, uh, I think, D.C. did where he said, I'm going to Substack and I'm just quitting Twitter. Uh, we, we talked about that 366 days from now. He's going to wish he had made a different decision. You can't abdicate social media. It still has to inform how you're putting work out there. And right. especially, especially, especially not only for, for for long form, but for for everybody. But if you're doing a long form comic and then and, and you're not publishing in this manner, then you are abdicating readers as well. Now, take it one more step. Take it to your website, especially long form people, especially long form people. If you are doing comics the way we did them in 2005, if I go to your home page today and I see page 12 with no intro, with no way of knowing what's going, you just you've just got page 12 there. Right. Right. And if it's not a satisfying reading experience, uh, what are you thinking? Don't do right. that. You're, if you're doing long form, your page should not be a 2005 webcomic site. It should be a landing page. You should have a cover there. You should have a, uh, a, a way to see the chapter entry. There should be something there to introduce me to. It's, it, it, you've got to completely rethink the way you're publishing because, again, <laughs> everybody's reading this stuff for the first time. We don't have the luxury of, of back uh, the way we did things uh, 15 years ago. You've got to completely rethink the way you're publishing. And, you know, a counterpoint to the idea that every day someone is reading your comic for the first time is mm -hmm. the idea that much like in marketing and advertising, someone needs to hear that message seven times. Yeah. This is where consistency and consistency of quality comes into your comics, too. So not yeah. only does each page have to be satisfying, not only does each page have to draw somebody in, it has to be consistent so that the memory is building that, you know what, I saw this Brad Geiger before and he made me laugh yes. last week. Yes. Now we're on number two. You know what? Now we're four comics in. It's, it's over the course of a couple of weeks on Instagram. I'm noticing this guy's work more and more. You know what? Yes. Seven times, eight times, 10 times, 20 yes. times in, I am going to follow him, but it had to have been consistent because uh, any one of those opportunities is frankly a chance to lose that reader. Um, right. And that's why you can have a comic that was viral. Like I've had comics that got out in front of millions of people, whether it was on Reddit, whether it was on Instagram, whether it was on Twitter, it yeah. just went viral for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. But this is why it's so hard to capture those people as permanent readers, because much yeah. like marketing, they need to see Dave Kellett more times and need to see that my <laughs> consistency, my quality was the same that that first one that they sparked with. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics.
Well, Brad, we're streaming this show live to our Comic Lab Live Gab audience, and yeah. uh, we had this question come in. Are you guys going to provide references back to the original episodes you guys pulled all these different comics commandments from? And I got to tell you, first of all, some incredibly good news. If you go over to ComicLabCashGrab.com right now, that's right, ComicLabCashGrab.com, because it's all about friendship and, and love, uh, right. you can get this magnet with all of these summarizing 20 comics commandments on it to hang in your yeah. workspace. And it's beautifully done, really. I not to oversell it, but it's really fun. We really yeah. love this magnet. So, and it's got we got two new pins going up at the same time yeah. uh, as the Comic Lab uh, um, Comics Commandments. So go over to Comic Lab Cash Grab again because it's all about friendship. Comic Lab Cash Grab dot com and get that magnet. Can we tell them about the pins yet or not? Are we going to sure tell them about secret? the pins? The pins are so cool. One of them is if you remember Dave uh, doing his own haircut during uh, the uh, quarantine. <laughs> one of them is just says artist's hands. And there's these two beautiful little, <laughs> just two little hands <laughs> sticking up. Uh, it's it's an absolute treat. And the other one uh, it, it is two word balloons in kind of a yin yang uh, 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 situation. Formation, yeah. Uh, and one of them is white with black lettering. The other one is upside down black with white lettering. And the the top one says word balloon. And the bottom one says chat bubble or speech bubble. <laughs> A vo right? Voice bubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Voice bubble. Yeah. What it, what, whichever yours is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a constant yin and yang, the fight between Brad and I of word balloon and voice bubble. Yes. Uh, and then artist hands also with the the, uh, the the fantastic 20 comics commandments magnet. And then the beautiful thing is, since there's only one uh, uh, little pin on the back is for the for the word balloon one. Uh, depending on how you put it on, you can show your allegiance by which one you make readable. You can spin it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so if you have, if you have speech bubble upright, then that that's easier to read than your team speech bubble. If you have <laughs> my side, the, the correct side upright, then that's your team word balloon and you can show your allegiance. And that's what we need in this country is one more reason for us to <laughs> one more one more political camp yeah, to stack and yeah, just take your claim to tribe. yeah to create to create more anger than, than necessary. Well, and the reason why we were able to bring uh, this delightful uh, list of twenty comics commandments to market and these two delightful pins is because we did comics commandment number fourteen, which yes. is to research your market. Not your mirror. Brad, do you want to tell us what you look at in your mirror and what you look at in your market? Oh. <laughs> well, first of all, let's not talk about what you look at in your mirror. I think you, no I, one needs that. Because I, I was just at the doctor this last week and I said, doctor, you, you got to help me. Every morning I wake up, I go to the bathroom, I look at the mirror and then I get uh, nauseous and vomit. I said, what's wrong with me? He says, I don't know, but your eyesight is perfect. <laughs> And for those listening at home, the year is 1933, and yes, you are in vaudeville. That's a nickel, a nickel to come see Brad Geiger performing today's vaudeville show. Uh, I hope everyone's got their nickel ready. Please no, please no wooden nickels as you come in. All right, so Brad, researching your market and not your mirror, if you don't mind putting down your rubber chicken and your violin to continue with the podcast. So, so it, it, it actually is a very important concept, and that is this. Don't don't get trapped <laughs> into this idea of I feel this way, therefore everybody feels this way. And and by the way, that's that, that is business advice, not art advice. Because when it comes to art, we're going to tell you to follow your personal vision. When Absolutely. it comes to writing or creative decision, we're going to tell you to follow your personal vision. But when it comes to business, that's when you've got to take that personal vision and step it back a little bit and look at what the realities of your market is. So it's so often we, we get trapped by this because we say, well, I don't like eBooks, therefore I'm not going to do any eBooks. Yes. Yes. Well, listen, pal, <laughs> you're closing the door on an awful lot of passive revenue. You put that ebook out once and then I get checks every month from the different places that I put my ebooks out there. And I only had to do it one time. I'm not particularly an ebook reader. I'm more of an audio book guy. You know, I'm, I, 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 I prefer that. But I don't I didn't make that decision by looking into my mirror. I made that decision by looking into my market.
That's right. Uh, I will give you a similar example um, uh, for a soft cover for my my drive book. Um, every time I do a drive book, I'm like, you yeah. know what? Shine it. I'm not doing a soft cover. This needs to be a high quality hard cover. That's what that's yes. what people deserve is a hard cover. And then I always unpleasantly find that my audience goes, you know what? I don't like hard covers. I prefer reading a soft cover. And <laughs> it's not it's not the majority. It's only ten or twenty percent of the people. Yeah. But had I not offered my current drive book as a soft cover. I would have been giving up uh, just ballparking here like ten, fifteen thousand dollars in the most recent Kickstarter. Yeah. That would have been dumb. I would have been following my mirror, what I wanted to put out into the world, which was mm -hmm. only a hardcover versus what the market itself was. So much like uh, Brad vomiting before he goes to see his doctor, you really want <laughs> you really want to follow your market and not your mirror. Yeah. Yeah. And and by the way, that's why we see T-shirts uh, being offered all the time by Garden Variety web cartoonists that has the 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 comic yes. logo on it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because they they're looking into the mirror and they say, I love this logo. Everybody would love this logo. It's like, you know, it's like a mother with a child. And this is a beautiful child. Everybody would love this child. You know, well, the, the fact of the matter is that's you're not you're not researching the market. People buy T-shirts to express who they are to the outside world, unless the logo of your comic or, you know, a, a headshot of that character does that, they're not going to buy it. You've got to research your market, not your mirror. Now, let's turn that completely on its head when we talk yeah. about your art. Now, remember, yeah. you're marketing your sales, uh, all, of, all the things that are generating income. That's listening to your market. But the spark that starts the whole fire, the thing that gets everything yeah. raging is the art itself. And for that, we turn to uh, a comics commandment number 15, which is never listen to a reader. Always listen to your readers. Brad, take us through yeah. that one. Well, it's it's another way of uh, navigating this personal relationship that we set up with our readers. In other words, one of the first things we said at the top of the show was uh, that self-publishing really works for us, right? In, in right. other words, you can't get fired by 10,000 readers or, or even 1,000 readers. Uh, it's, it's a lot harder to get fired. Uh, that sets up this personal relationship that we have with our readers, whether it's just through social media, through uh, Patreon, through Kickstarter. We have a lot of personal interaction that goes on there. That's mm -hmm. very good. And it's it, it, it's overall very positive and it allows us to make a living. The problem is every now and again, you've got one reader <laughs> that either yeah. says something untoward or says something critical or, or yeah, it just gets inside of your head. And that can be very difficult, right? You've yes. got somebody yeah. who wants to tell you, well, I think I know how drive should be done. You know, yeah, drive, you've got, you know, like Dave once had one reader tell him that he's got the wrong artist on drive <laughs> right. Right, right. And, Dave, and by the way dave's the artist on dave's drive. the it's artist comics. Yeah. if you can imagine somebody saying that but but uh, but the thing is is that you never let one reader get into your head you never let you never take that too seriously by the way that goes for compliments and criticism you don't let one reader convince you that you're the king of the world either but uh it, but you can't let one reader uh, have a, a, a lot of say in how you do your stuff. On the other hand, if you're hearing this from a lot of readers, then you've got to uh, take uh, another look at what is being said there. Or if you're seeing, for example, on social media, you're losing a lot of followers. Uh, you, you, you're making a certain type of post that keeps resulting in people unfollowing you. Right. Well, that's, right. A, that's a number of readers who are giving you feedback. That's the sort of thing you absolutely should be paying attention to. But one reader, one comment from one reader, you never let that get in your way. Well, and because here's the reason, here's the dirty little secret about sharing anything online yeah. is that as soon as you get above five people, there will always be one cantankerous jerk there will always be one person that no matter what you do, you paint it blue, they wish it was red. You make it yep. tall, they wish it was short. Yep. You give them bread, they wish it was rice. It doesn't matter what it is, they're going to find a way to complain about the thing that you've put out into the world, right? Yeah. And so you really want to avoid that person. But I will do a counter argument on Brad saying that also means that you cannot accept one reader's compliment. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will say that my personal <laughs> philosophy is that 
Life can be unkind and the journey can be hard. Take whatever joy you can. If someone's offering you kind words, take it. For God's sakes, allow yourself to have joy from time to time. Allow yourself to internalize some positivity and good feedback. So even if it's one person, hold on to it like a cherished uh, treasure and and take that kindness uh, is my advice. On no, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Yeah, do do take that and 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 hold it close because Dave is is completely right sometimes those moments are few and far between so you don't want to uh, uh pass up that opportunity but also let's take a look at also in terms of listening to one reader and what dave just got done saying and in fact that if, 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 if you made it blue they want it red sometimes people and this happens throughout social media they have long since learned that the best way to get somebody's attention is to say something negative Yes. And how many yes. times, Dave, have you and I both found that the person saying negative, nasty, angry things, uh, a number one, usually is dealing with their own pain in their Absolutely. life. But number two, just wants to be heard. And yeah. they know that the quickest way to get you to answer back is not by saying something positive, not by being a, a, a great member of the community, but by being that person who stands out and says, well, I didn't think you drew that nose quite right, or I didn't think that that punchline worked. Uh, and and really what they're just trying to do is get attention. And again, um, especially if it's a nasty comment, we've told you this before, you starve that person out. They want attention. They want oxygen. Yeah. Let them suffer. <laughs> Don't give it to them. You know how Brad always says that uh, things on social media really quickly drop to the bottom of the fish tank? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have found nothing hangs more painfully in the air than mean comments to me on Twitter that I don't respond to. Yeah. You can feel on the other end as I'm responding to everybody else who's offering yep. kindness, kind yep. words, offering humor. Even the people that are offering criticism wrapped in cleverly done humor, I will respond to. Yeah. But the one person who is genuinely a dick, it falls to the bottom of that fish tank uh yeah. because why feed that that first of all it's it's a culture that we've all been trained by customer service and corporations that we have to come out guns blazing yeah. like i i missed the, in this guy kia set for a bookshelf i'm missing a screw and by god you're gonna send me an extra screw and right. you know of course ikea is well we're so sorry we're gonna they forget that there's a person on the other end of those comments and that yeah. you're creating art and by the way putting it out for free for them to read right mm -hmm. and so uh, I have often found that the people that come at me with w sometimes unnecessarily sharp criticism, mm -hmm. if I just come back to them with a kindness, they go, they kind of go, oh, I didn't even think you would read this as though yeah. I'm not alive and they didn't at me. I don't know what, <laughs> what they were thinking. Yeah. But it's like Brad was saying, they're so used to not having connection that when you give them connection, you realize that frankly, they're, a, they're kind of a sad and lonely and hurt person that was yeah. kind of, you know, uh, lashing out online. Mm -hmm. um, but more than anything else, just don't feed that troll. Just respond right. to kindness online right. rather because, than- uh, Because at the end of the day, if you do feed the troll, you're positively reinforced that behavior. And yes. as you know, from Psych 101, uh, any behavior that you, you reinforce is going to be repeated. So that brings us to uh, <laughs> another bad behavior on uh, <laughs> commandment number 16. The first person is to say they want the merch is the first person to disappear when you make the merchandise. Dave, it's, 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 a, it's a law that, we, that goes back to the very early days of web comics. They say, I want that on a T-shirt. You say, here's the T-shirt, and they disappear in a puff of smoke. Brad, can I make a request? Can you put the phrase, the first person to say they want the merch is the first person to disappear when you make the merch. Can you put that on a t-shirt for me, Brad? Because I'm going to be the first person to buy that. I yeah. guarantee I'm going to buy that t-shirt, Brad. Yeah, yeah. And and then here's the thing. As we've said again and again on the show, you're, yeah, it's, it's a version of, of, of not listening to your to your market in terms of listening to your reader, not your, or your readers, not your reader. Mm -hmm. Unless there is a great clamoring, yeah. I guarantee that single individual person that said loved that comic today gosh that punchline was great you got to put that on a t-shirt i'm going to be the first one in line they don't mean that it's just no. their way of expressing exuberance and the way of, of, of expressing like gosh excitement in that moment they're not going to buy that t-shirt they're not going to buy that that bit of merch go ahead brad yeah and not only that but i'm so petty that i have proven this time and time again because i've got a red bubble account and i can make a t-shirt available yep. in and i've timed this under five minutes 
I, if somebody says I want that on a t-shirt, I can have a response in about four minutes and 30 seconds with a link. Here's the shirt. And they never had that. Not once have they bought it. And I'm so petty. I do it every time. <laughs> I want that on a t-shirt. Great. Here it is. I've got, I've got a, I've got a, a, a system. I've got everything ready to go. All of a sudden somebody says that the lights start spinning red over here. What you've got one of those sirens that goes whoop, whoop, whoop. I, and I, I, a man on a mission, boom, 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 boom. Four minutes, 30 seconds later, here's the link Buy the t-shirt. They're gone. They're, 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 they're like, like, like you held up a crucifix in front of a Dracula. He's just poof gone. <laughs> and here's the thing. Uh, the thing that I have learned is when you're early on in your career, you're just so happy to feel the pulse. You're like, oh, thank God someone responded. You know what? I, yes, I will make a T-shirt out of this because Jimmy Boom Boom asked for a T-shirt. So I'm going to make Jimmy. Well, I don't know why I'm calling him Jimmy Boom Boom. Jimmy <laughs> Boom Boom asked for a T-shirt. I'm going to make Jimmy Boom. I make the T-shirt. Jimmy Boom Boom's gone, right? But the, the thing you learn over time is, oh, is it five people now? Is it 15 people asking for a T-shirt? You know mm -hmm. what? Maybe I'll consider it. But then a day goes by. You give yourself the pause. No one else is asking for that T-shirt anymore. You yeah. know why? Because they never really want it in the first place. It was just a way of expressing affection. So yeah. Take that affection, internalize it. Don't make the shirt unless there is a massive clamor. And frankly, unless you yourself believe that that merch needs to exist in the world and then make it. But not not when you get one person chiming in saying, you got to make that as a T-shirt. <laughs> That's right. And that brings us to commandment number 17, David. That's right. And 17 is, frankly, I think one of Brad's uh, most cleverly phrased uh, uh, bits of language that he's ever made. This is about crowdfunding. Number 17 is about crowdfunding. First comes the crowd, then comes the funding. Yeah. And we see this get turned around all the time where people are like, I'm going to bring it to Kickstarter. And Kickstarter will be the platform that will make this heretofore unknown project suddenly come to life. No, 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 no. You've got it all yeah. backwards, my friend. You First, you've got to build that 100-person audience into 1,000 and then into 10,000 and then ideally 20, 30, 40. And first, you've got to build that crowd, build the passion, build the repetitive, uh, uh, you know, the trained audience that goes back to it as a source of entertainment and joy in their life. Then you go for the funding. Right. And it's the same thing for somebody that hasn't started posting comics yet, but they've got their Patreon all figured out, right? <laughs> it's like, I haven't, I haven't yes. uh, pushed the button on a comic yet, but Patreon is all ready to go. Well, yeah. wait a minute, wait a minute. You got to You got to build that crowd first and then uh, monetize that crowd. People in the early days looked at Patreon like an ATM. Right. I'm just going to I'm just going to even if I've never done anything, I'm going to set a Patreon up and, it, and it's I'm going to start uh, cashing checks. And they found out very quickly it don't work that way. You've got right. to build the crowd and then take that crowd to Patreon and monetize them using some strategies that we've talked about on the show uh, for over 200 episodes. Uh, but you got to have that crowd first. It doesn't work the other way around. You cannot take a shortcut. You've got to put the time in and then you can start to monetize. And shortcut is the right word to use there yeah. in the sense that it takes time and it takes years and it takes hours of of putting in the work to build a comic, to build a world that people are enjoying enough that they say, I would miss this if it was gone. And frankly, I want more of it in my life. I'm willing yeah. to support it with Patreon. I'm willing to support it with a book. Um, you can't lead with the funding if you haven't proved your worth to someone's life yet. And that, frankly, yeah. takes years. So yeah. first comes the crowd, then comes the funding. Well, Brad, we're coming into the home stretch, and here is Comics Commandment number 18. And this one, uh, I, I, it, frankly, is I think another Brad-generated one that I, it, it really delights me. That is, it's easy to be in the right place at the right time if you're always there. Oh, yeah. It's super important to realize that. By the way, what a creepy, oh, yeah, that was. That guy was a little too... <laughs> A little too heartfelt. <laughs> You're saying my words to me. This is <laughs> this is my like, ultimate you, fantasy. It's like you were suddenly wearing a satin <laughs> t-shirt against against your chest. There, You're like, oh yeah, this is oh, this is yeah. the stuff. Oh, that was some I'll good wordsmithing on the part of me. <laughs> 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 but it is the truth. It's easy to be, and and what that means is this. So again, it kind of uh, pairs up with that idea of uh, you know, kind of well, why does success happen to other people? Uh, it does. You're, you're com 
pairing somebody's uh, blooper reel to a highlight reel, what it means is the more you're there, the more you keep putting in the time, the more you stick to it, the more you're hanging around, the more chances are that you're going to be in the right place at the right time when your moment comes. It's a reminder not to get upset or disappointed or disillusioned because your moment hasn't happened there. Uh, right. There's, there's going to be a moment for you and the best place to make sure that you're in a position to take advantage of it is to keep showing up. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I'll give you a personal example of this in a field that really is not my passion. So it's actually a very apt, uh, example to show. Um, my wife and I did sketch comedy a lot in LA back in the yeah. day. I did it basically to hone my own writing and creativity. Sort of, I would, I would laugh for an hour and I would come away a better writer because all my serotonin was firing. It's much like this podcast with you is that it, it fed a certain beast in terms of, uh, firing up the creative engines, right? Mm -hmm. My wife did it for similar reasons because it, it gave her writing ideas for both of us. It gave us writing writing ideas and it also fired up the serotonin. Anyway, we had a good friend who did sketch with us all the time. Brad, he was always there. When yeah. he wasn't performing, he was watching other groups doing sketch. When he right. wasn't watching them, he was he was planning out when they were going to do sketch shows. He was always doing it, right? And he has since, because he was always there, opportunities would fall onto his plate of being like, you know, who would be great to do this is blankety blank. Hey, you know who right. we should hire to write that commercial? Blankety blank. Hey, you know who'd be great to do that short film? Blankety blank. Hey, guess who's now doing feature films? Blankety blank. Because yeah. he was always there, right? He always put in the time. And of course, people are going to think of him for when opportunities arise. Right. And because cartooning was my love, that's where I was always placed, right? That's where Brad Geiger was always placed. And so if you're always thinking thinking about comics while you're eating dinner, while you're going, you're always going to be ready to make a new comic tomorrow. You're always going to be uh, uh, primed to be uh, receptive to creativity when it comes. Um, and so why, why am I getting a weird smile? I got the, I got the honest smile out of you that I wasn't sure how to read that. <laughs> no, I'm loving what you're saying. I, I, I've got, I, I, you're, you're, you're putting it beautifully. And that is that you just got to keep showing up. You got to yeah. keep, even, even when it feels like you're not getting anywhere, they, maybe you're not this week, but next week you might, uh, you know, and, 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 in in that time that you're spending showing up, keep working on your craft, keep working on trying to get better at the quality of what you're doing. It's all time well spent. Here's the worst case scenario is uh, comics doesn't work out for you. And we've had this conversation with people on the show before where we say, listen, maybe you're just not a cartoonist. Maybe this yeah. isn't the right fit for right. you. Right. Uh, and, and that's a, that's a grief period for people. Sometimes it's a, it's a moment of mourning and of loss. Uh, but uh, in all things, uh, it's also a transition and you will take what you learned doing comics to the next thing that you do. And if you right. do something else right. that's creative, fantastic, uh, more power to you. Maybe you maybe you turn to something completely different. I, and I'm just going to pull something out of the air of well, fatherhood. Maybe you're like that nah, comics didn't work out, but you know, we're having kids pretty soon and uh, I'm going to turn my full attention to being the best dad I can be. Uh, you will take everything you learned through comics and I guarantee you it's going to give you all kinds of resources to be an incredible dad to this kid, right? right, uh, right. No matter what you end up doing, it's going to feed that next thing. Even if it's not something that you and I would consider creative, you, it's, there's no such thing as wasted time. This was good time that you spent. Okay. Uh, and, and meanwhile, if you are in it for the long haul, uh, then yes, you will eventually be at the right place at the right time, but you never worry about wasting time. All of the time you spend doing this is going to uh, turn out to be something. Right. But getting getting back to Brad's central idea that uh, if you're uh, you're you're always uh, in the right place at the right time, if you're always there, I want to talk yeah. about Brad's writing block from a couple weeks ago, because I think this is instructive. Brad uh, stayed with it. He stayed right yeah. there in the trenches, even though he was sweating it out and, and feeling probably a lot of self-hatred, yes. probably a lot of self-doubt. But he yes. stuck with it because his love for comics kept him fired up about the overall process of making and creating and being a cartoonist, even in that moment, he was dried up as a desert and couldn't come up with an idea. Right. And so well, maybe not as a desert. No, I no, a, Brad, it was terrible. It was a train wreck. No, Brad, you were a living train wreck. Let's not, let's not mince words here. No, Brad, it was, it was hopeless. Desert. No, Brad, it was. I had a little slump. 
<laughs> no, no. I mean, listen, you should have thrown in the towel. Let's be honest. You should have. That should you should have called it. No, but here, let's talk about writers that did call it. Like, yeah. I mean, in the same moment, you have many examples throughout history of writers just walking away. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I know he did some writing over the decades, but J.D. Salinger kind of a little bit got into a writer's block. And he's like, I I forgot how to write unlikable characters that Dave Kellett doesn't want to read. And th that he didn't put out any more books. And <laughs> Sorry, unnecessary shot against J.D. Salinger, who I don't like. Boy, um, I, I hope he's not a Patreon backer. <laughs> If he was, he's got some six feet under issues right now that that are bigger than uh, not being my Patreon backer. But anyway, what I'm getting at is that the, if you're in the right place at the right time, you'll fight through all the, the frankly crappy moments of creativity because you love it so much that you yeah. want to get to the good moments. And uh, so that's one that's one of my uh, favorite uh, commandments uh, there. So let's move on to number 19, which is. And, and this one I am incredibly passionate about. This is frankly the mantra um, uh, that Glow, my wife and I, Gloria and I, fire up our own careers with, which is yeah. this. No one will ever care about your career as much as you do. So go out and make your own magic. Yeah. And boy, do I live by this credo, which is that I am not the best cartoonist in the world. I will never be the best cartoonist in the world. No, I agreed. don't have the biggest agreed. audience. I will never have the biggest audience. Right. But I will care about my career and put as much passion and control and ownership in as I can. And yeah. I will, by God, make my own magic. I will outwork most people I know because I love what I do and I love being yeah. a cartoonist. And yes, I have a limited size audience. And and yes, I'm, I only have a certain skill set that might not get much higher than, than my hopes and dreams would wish they could get to. Right. But by God, I'm going to make my own magic. And I'm sincere. I'm very passionate about this. Yeah. But this is how you build a career. You, you you, uh, you care about your career in a way that no one else ever will, and you make your own magic by God. Go ahead, Brad, jump yeah, in. Yeah, well, what you just sung is the battle hymn of the self-publisher. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's and no one's ever going to care as much about your career as you will. Uh, and, and you do have the, the wherewithal to do this uh, in terms of self-publishing. Uh, I've said it a hundred times. Um, if you are a creative individual, you are in the everyday business of taking nothing and making something. Right. If right. you're a visual right. artist, you start with a blank page and you make it something. If you're a sculptor, you start with a rock and you make it something. If you're a potter, you start with a lump of clay. You see where I'm going here creativity, the act of taking nothing and making something is the highest level of human brain activity. There's nothing higher than creativity. <laughs> I always, I always do laugh when you, when you go on the shtick about there is no, there is no greater calling the physician, the astronaut. There is no greater moment than a creative person being creative. No, you're this is the moment humanity has risen from the caves for. Well, listen, I, 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 I mean, we, we can go into the weeds on whether a doctor can be creative or not, but I, I will stand by that. that no, there's nothing I, I know I'm joking. Bigger I'm joking. Than creativity. And if you can do that, you can do your taxes. Yes. If you, can, you can do figure that, out a business. you can handle yeah. a book run. If you can yes. do that, you can set up a Kickstarter. Those are things you can easily learn. Creativity is the hard part. Uh, you can learn to run your Patreon right. So uh, that's why I, that's the underlying message here of nobody will ever care about your career. Cause there's so many young people that are like, well, I don't want to learn business. I just want to learn. I just want to do comics. I don't want to learn business. I just want to right. make comics. Right. Uh, and, and I'm going to let the I'm going to let the publisher do all that part. Yeah. But here's the thing: the publisher will care about you for one quarter when they're pushing your book. <laughs> yeah. That uh, this happens to more friends than I care to count. Oh. The next quarter comes around, their book ain't pushed so much anymore. Yeah. But when yeah. you when you are making your own magic, my job is even though I just said no one will ever care about your career as much as you do, my job is to make the world care. Right. right. My job is to make you care this quarter, next quarter, three quarters from now. That. Drive yep. is a great story and you should read it. That's my, like a publicist won't care anymore. A PR person won't care anymore. A marketing mm -hmm. person for a publisher won't care anymore, but I will. And that's why you got to make your own magic. 
And that means it's a perfect time for us to get to our 20th and final comic commandment. And this is one that hopefully kind of leaves you in the right mindset for everything you've heard up until now mm-hmm. and, uh, and, 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 and kind of gives you a way to uh, go forward in the rest of your comics making process. And it's this. Being an overnight success will take you about 10 years. Your career is a marathon, not a sprint. It is not a sprint. And uh, and listen, might we be a little bit off by saying 10 years? Might you be able to do it in five or seven? Yes. Maybe. Might it take you 15 years? Yes. Yeah. But the idea here is that you need to change your mindset that the work you put in now will mean you'll have a career in comics in two weeks. It takes time. It takes time to build both your own skill set uh, yeah. In your writing, in your in your drawing, it takes time to build that audience from five people to 15 people to yep. 50 people to 500 people. And uh, all of that is a slow and steady build. It's the turtle, not the, the hare in, in terms yeah. of uh, the race. And uh, it also means, David, though, if you don't mind me interjecting, is this you don't get to be upset that your fame didn't happen this week. You don't get to be upset that it didn't happen next month either. Uh, You get to keep working because uh, it doesn't happen for anyone that way, uh, right? I mean, even these people that just just exploded onto the scene, when you dig a little bit deeper, you find out they've been doing it this for a long time too. Uh, everybody does, works at this. Yes, there's a couple people, you know, we call them the people that caught lightning in a bottle, the, the right. lottery winners that actually did just uh, wake up one morning and uh, capture the zeitgeist. You can't be up any more upset about that than you are that you didn't win the actual lottery in your state uh, this month. Uh you can't, you can't get upset. You get to keep working, knowing that this is a long haul deal. You're in a marathon. You can't get all wrapped up with the fact that you're not famous this week. And, and part of that is too, is that if, if this kind of life, this kind of creative life, even if you're not in comics and just living a creative life in some similar or parallel field, Mm -hmm. uh, if that was easy, quite literally everybody would be doing it. Yeah. It it takes work it, in the same way that it takes eight years to be a doctor. It takes X yeah. number of years to be a lawyer. It takes time and work and repetitive practice with consistency and with an eye for editorializing your own work to get better and better and better. Uh, but yeah. the payoff is that there is no better career. There is no better path than comics. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I love it. But it did take me seven, 10, 15 years to get to a point yeah. where I could start to say, Start to say, oh, this is becoming a career. It takes time. Yeah. We say this all the time. And I actually had one person, uh, I I said, you know, there are more people who can say they make their full-time living in the NBA than there are people who can say they do what I do for a full-time living. Right. And the guy says, well, there's something wrong with that. If that's the case, there, what's, what's the matter that there's not more people doing this uh, for a living? What are they missing? I'm like quality, (laughs) you know, (laughs) it takes a long time. It takes a lot of dedication to get to the point where you're doing this to, to the extent that somebody wants to pay for it uh, and, and buy books and stuff like that. It's, this is not uh, something that comes easily. This is something you're going to have to work for, but like Dave says, it is so worth it. And, uh, you know, part of that, too, is that I I can I don't even know who you were talking to, Brad, but it's because comics are deceptively simple. But the simplicity is born out of 10 years of practice (laughs) at reductiveness, you know, reducing a face to its to its clearest and most uh, uh, reductive lines, reducing your writing down to its bare essence. Right. To make it still powerful while using the fewest words. And so it it um, it is it's my the way to to I describe it is to, to externalize it and say, people are always thinking, oh, children's books must be easy to write. Yes. There's 200 words in a child's book. It's 32 pages. It's all basic. Okay, I challenge you. It takes a lot of incredible work, yeah. at, again, at reductiveness, mm-hmm. to write a clear, powerful, emotionally resonant children's book. It is one of the hardest things you can do. Yeah. So, yes, it looks simple, but you know what? Ballet looks simple, too. Uh, but <laughs> it, I guarantee I can't do it. It, yeah. it takes a long time. And being, like Brad said, being an overnight success takes about 10 years. It might be a little off on that number, but it's going to take you about 10 years. So keep in mind and focus yourself that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Absolutely. And that is the 20 comics commandments. And you'll notice each one of those, Dave and I spoke very forcefully. We spoke 
We spoke very passionately. We told you exactly how it is, uh, as if we were sharing objective truths, right? right. Like, like, right. like, literally, that's kind of why we tongue in cheek called them the comics commandments, as if they're chiseled in stone. And we feel passionately about every one of them. We have real world experience between the two of us on every one of them. However, we're going to add one more thought. It's not a commandment, but it's a thought we want you to keep in the back of your mind as you're listening to this show, uh, or perhaps as you're listening to your own magnet that you've mm -hmm. gotten at comiclabcashgrab.com. And that is what? <laughs> and that is this, that there are many paths to the same mountain. Oh. Uh, Brad and I, as much as we are convinced that this is the right path, that these yeah. are the 20 comics commandments, yeah. uh, tongue in cheek as it is, that you should follow. Uh, if you are passionate about it, if you put in the work, if you follow your heart, you can build an entirely different career. Yeah. In fact, we have an upcoming guest, uh, one of my favorite people in the world, Scott C, who has built an entirely different career than I have on an entirely different path. But yeah. I cherish and value the path that he took yeah. because ultimately uh, it takes commitment, it takes consistency, it takes hard work, it takes stick to uh, and it takes clear-eyed uh, uh, editorializing on what your shortfalls are so that you can get better yeah. at them. You yeah. do those things. And any combination of these 20 comic commandments will get you where you want to go. You can take a very different path than mm -hmm. Brad and I, uh, and, and still find a successful joy filled career. In fact, we hope you do. We yeah. hope you do because yeah. each one of us is doing our own experiment in the real world. And if you do your experiment and you do yours differently, you know that we're going to want to hear about it because, frankly, we might want to steal it for right. ourselves one day. We right. want to hear about your experience. We want to hear that you did it differently and you found uh, this high level of success that brought you uh, the satisfaction. We want to hear about that. We want you to go out there and do your experiment. Uh, we've got uh, we we also we want to save you some of the trouble we had, which is why we uh, are talking about the twenty uh, comics commandments. But if you want to go out there and do it differently, and if you find success, no one, and I mean this uh, sincerely, no one is going to be cheering for you louder than Dave and I. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because this is also, it's not a career anymore. That's a zero sum game where for yeah. Brad and I to succeed, yeah. you have to fail. We want you to succeed so that we can learn in turn from you as friends. Uh, and and likewise is the same so that you can learn from us as friends because uh, th again, because print is no longer the limiter, this is not a zero sum game. So it only benefits us to see you thrive and survive and, and live a wonderful career. So yeah. with all the best of luck, I think Brad, uh, this has been a successful 200th episode and we thank you all for tuning in with us yeah. for 200 shows because this has become one of the great joys of my life. Uh, Brad, if you want to know a little secret, I think you're a wonderful person and I love doing this show with you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel exactly the same way. I'm not even gonna, I'm not even, not even going to make that a joke. I, I honestly, uh, Tuesdays are the highlight of my week because I know I'm going to look across the camera and see you over there. And, and I know that it's going to be not only a thoughtful, funny experience, but I'm going to come away with a sense of optimism that I probably didn't have when I woke up this morning. So thank you for being there for 200. And, and frankly, I can't wait to get started on the next 200. Absolutely. Absolutely. My friend, this is a, this is a joy filled uh, journey we have been on both in comics and in this podcast. And I, I sincerely thank you for that. Well, then that means that it's my privilege to once again tell you that you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my wonderful friend who I look forward to making the next 200 shows with Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And my close personal friend Dave Kellett, the co-director of the comics documentary Stripped and cartoonist of Sheldon at SheldonComics.com and Drive at DriveComic.com. And we thank, of course, our sponsors and friends, the good folks over at Wacom at WACOM.com, who have been along with us for so much of this ride. And we thank them for the support and the belief in the show, uh, because, frankly, we believe in those Wacoms as well. It's one of the, the one of the mainstays of our career is using both our, our Cintiqs and our Wacom ones. And uh, the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And on this 200th episode, I will highly suggest you go check out theworldrecord.net. Uh, yes. Andy has fantastic music that I love. It is delightful. 
delightful to cartoon to. And this episode was edited by the wonderful Matt Woodard, who we thank so much for all his work. Uh, this show has been <laughs> elevated because of his skills mm -hmm. um, and frankly, his kindness in spotting uh, problems that we didn't even see and yeah. helping us become better in our audio skills. Uh, and Matt is over at Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. And if you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode. David, I got this message uh, on Twitter that I want to share with you along those okay. lines. It says, hey, Brad, been listening to Comic Lab while delivering FedEx packages, and I just <laughs> recently signed up for the Patreon. You and Dave have me laughing like a madman while I'm delivering packages, and I'm sure that image has some people think I'm going postal. Keep up the good work. That came in from at Zodiac Legends. Uh, looks like they're doing a wonderful comic on Webtoons called Legends of the Zodiac. Uh, I just wanted to pass that along, Dave, That's because the idea of somebody delivering FedEx packages listening to us brings me great joy. I, I, I don't know why this this suddenly popped into my mind, but wouldn't it be just the loveliest kismet if they pull up to a house or a building and the package says Brad Geiger or Dave <laughs> Kellett on it? Wouldn't that be lovely? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Just, that, but anyway, that is a lovely, very clear image of someone driving around a FedEx truck and, and listening to us. And gosh, that what kind of words. Thank you for that. I'm going to say Comic Lab is made possible by your kind support over at patreon.com slash comic lab. I'm not even going to say it twice because what I am going to say is thank you because yeah. your support at Patreon Patreon has genuinely been uh, uplifting, heartwarming. The community has been wonderful oh. and so supportive of one another over, on, especially over on the Discord server. Yes, in sharing tips and tricks, in sharing insights, in helping uplift one another, in helping with writing tips and art tips and business tips. And I am so thankful to the community and the kind folks that are within it. And I know Brad is too. Yeah. So I will say it once again: Patreon.com/slash Comic Lab. Step right up, step right up. Brad Geiger appearing here with the vaudeville jokes of today and tomorrow. Brad Geiger, five cents a nickel, just a nickel. That's you, pretty lady. You young man, Brad Geiger up on stage. Man came up to me last week and said, I haven't had a bite in weeks, I so, so I bit him. That was Brad Geiger. Brad Geiger, five cents a nickel, worth every penny. <laughs> I have to shake it all the time. 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 I have to shake it all the 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 time. It's one that we all constantly have to shake. I have to shake it all the time. I have to shake it all the time. Shake it all the time. I have to shake it all the time. Shake it all the time, shake it all the time, shake it all the 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 time 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 Shake it all the time 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 Shake it all the time 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 It's one that we all constantly have to shake, I have to shake it all the time 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 it's one that we all constantly have to shake. I have to shake it all the time. 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 Shake it. Shake it all the time. Shake it all the time. Shake it. Shake it all the time. Shake it all the time. Shake it. 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 Shake it.